The world that we live in is filled with chaos. We are all searching for meaning in our lives, but we often get lost along the way. We all must ultimately realize that meaning is found in responsibility for our actions, for the way we live our life, and for the people in our lives. We don't have to stay in the chaos. We can choose to bring order to our lives. Join us for a fresh perspective on the practical steps we can take to become who God intended us to be and to realize what our calling is. This is Coming Out of Chaos. Welcome back to the Coming Out of Chaos podcast. My name is Michael Bocklig. I am your host, and I'm joined as always by my co-host and good friend, Bryce Kirk. We are recording this episode at the 2022 Dom C. Fall Retreat here at St. Ignatius Orthodox Church in Franklin, Tennessee. We mentioned in our last episode that we would be doing this recording with a live audience, and we're here to make good on that promise. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to say this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, We've already had a really good chance to speak to a lot of people who are here, and um, we really wish you could be with us live We have a lot of really great people here, and we're looking forward to a fantastic discussion. Absolutely. And Bryce, the fall retreat has just been an incredible experience for me. There's been such amazing talks and workshops and the fellowship in between the events. You know, we've talked about this in past episodes, but for me, this is what it's all about. It's about being in person. It's about being in community, in communion with each other. It's something you can't do through a computer screen. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's there. Nothing replaces being in person with other people. That interaction, the face to face, all of it is irreplaceable. And it's just a fantastic aspect of being human. We want to thank all of our listeners and those that are actually here physically with us today. And this is going to be a special episode. It's a little bit different because we're going to ask for some interaction from our audience and some discussion points throughout this episode. Now, in this episode, I want to let everybody know, both in person and listening to us, we're going to be discussing some content that came from an Orthodox Christian's men's retreat that took place last year. The retreat took place at St. Seraphim OCA Cathedral in Dallas, Texas, and it was on September 25th, 2021, so almost exactly a year ago. The title of that retreat was The Path of the Christian Man, and a talk was given by Father Hans Jacobsi at that retreat, and that title of the talk was Brotherhood, Learning How to Become a Man Through Communion with Other Men. The full talk is actually available on our Amen YouTube channel, so if you want to look at that, if you want to see it, if you want to hear it, it's on our YouTube channel, and you can go ahead and and listen to that really at any time. Father Hans, unfortunately, was not able to be with us here at the Fall Retreat, but he's going to live on here through this podcast. A lot of the words that he spoke at that retreat we're going to be talking about here in this podcast episode recording. So we have a lot to talk about, and we're going to dive right into it. First off, I want to start with something from the spiritual Psalter from St. Ephraim the Syrian. Make me whole, O Lord, and I will become whole. Only wise and merciful physician, I beseech thy benevolence. Heal the wounds of my soul and enlighten the eyes of my mind, that I may understand my place in thy eternal design. You know, it's such a beautiful, it's just such a beautiful excerpt there from the spiritual Psalter, Bryce. And to understand what our place is in God's eternal design, we have to learn who we are, and what we are made for, and how our souls will be healed. The chaos in the world has harmed us all very deeply, and our souls need to be healed of that. And the reality is, in our culture, we are all damaged. We're all hurt in some way. No one comes to the church undamaged. The Lord leads us to the church, but he did not call us into the church so we can contribute to the church our own wisdom, our own ideas, and our own opinions. He called us into the church to be healed, That's why we're here. We're all in need of healing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nobody does come in undamaged. And I think oftentimes, at least in my personal experience, um, especially being a man, many men, particularly young men, are searching for meaning outside of the church before they find the church. We may have had no exposure at all to the church prior to that. We may have never had any faith background, nothing of that sort adrift by ourselves, whatever it may be. And a lot of time, many people try to find their meaning through the flesh or vain pursuits, whatever that is. And so oftentimes the effects of culture may not be explicit to us for one reason or another. But as the truth is revealed to us, we begin to see through the facade 
and we understand that there's much more to life than we've been presented through our culture, through media, whatever it may be, even through our own experience. Yeah, no, that's well said, Bryce. And, you know, the primary energy in the dominant culture that surrounds us is aimed towards the disintegration of the human person. The disintegration of the human person leads to the lessening of the knowledge of what a man was really created for. Man slips into a powerlessness, and he slips into a despair. Words are not enough to heal it. The soul itself must be healed. The culture has also taught us things that are blatantly not true. There's just a lot of lies out there. And when we're young, we tend to assimilate it. It's an osmosis of the soul. We are shaped by the age to which we are born into, and that's something Father Hans has shared with us several times in the past. This is our first point of reflection and discussion. So as I ask this question, if anybody has any thoughts, please come up here to our third microphone here for our guests. I want you all to answer this question. What are some examples of things that the culture has taught us that are blatantly not true and have led to the increase of chaos, and how has it affected you? Bryce, why don't you kick things off? And others, feel free to come up. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, The main thing that comes to mind, the main lie that comes to mind, is that truth is a relative concept. And in, in so much that it is relative to you or to me. Now, we have our perspectives, that's one thing, but truth itself is not relevant. And I do think this goes in ha- hand in hand with what I mentioned previously, and that there are so many truths out there, right? Your truth, my truth, whatever that might be. Right. And we're presented with this in a variety of concepts, a variety of situations. Truth, rather, is not an abstract concept. It's not an idea. It is a man, and that man is Jesus Christ. What do you all think? Is there anybody that has any comments? Feel free to come up. One thing that I've seen both in my life and my experience and in the experience of my fellow brothers is the belief, rather maybe the taught idea, that pleasure is a high priority, maybe the highest priority that anyone can seek in life. And this is especially being planted in the minds of our men in the 21st century. When when you look at the experiences that we're seeking after, they, they're, they're a craving that comes from our creative energy that's given to us by God for very good, holy purposes. Yeah. When it comes to a selfish point, that's when the cosmos turns into chaos. Mm. And it's the seeking after our passions that are these very highly pleasurable experiences that are the the antithesis to experiencing the mysteries of the church, which are experiences of high spiritual enrichment. So when a man engages in good, holy acts in marriage, it's beautiful, it's blessed, it's ordained. Yeah. When you separate all the things that come with marriage, quite literally taking them out of context, it becomes, it becomes a cycle that feeds itself further and further into a state of misery. You're taking the spirit out of the action. It becomes misdirected. Yes. Yeah. Those are really good comments. Why don't you, why don't you state for our listeners your first name? We'll do that for each person that comes up and talks. This is Kellen. Thank you, Kellen, very much for your comments. Let's have our next person up here to share their thoughts. What is your name? My name's Ben. And uh, this, this will kind of follow on to what we just heard, heard from Kellen. Uh, not only are we, are we misdirecting uh, our energies toward these, these uh, shallow pleasures, when they, we should be directing our energies toward, uh, toward the, the, the worship of God and, and toward our, our, own, our, our own theosis. Uh, we, uh, we're told that we can be pleasure-seeking without consequences. You know, there's a, a birth control pill that will help you to fornicate better. There is a uh, abortion as a as a uh, as, as a prophylactic should should the, the should the birth control fail or should you forget to uh, take it? Uh, we we can eat as many donuts as we want because once you get diabetes, you can get an insulin shot. It becomes almost a case of the old lady who swallowed the fly, and we we ask throughout that entire story, why oh why did she swallow that fly? <laughs> let's let's go back to the very beginning and not sin in the first place. Instead of trying to enrich doctors and enrich uh, other supposed healers, 
who are doing nothing more than allowing us to continue to be sick. And making a lot of money in the process. That's right. Yeah, that's, those are really very profound comments. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's go to our next guest here. Why don't you state your name for everybody listening? Hello, I'm Andrew. Thanks for joining us. So what's your comment? Okay, so it is leading on to the following question you stated earlier before anybody else was able to show up and talk to you. Um, my thought was influence. Many people think that, well, it's been taught that you, people in the orthodox uh, way like to have fellowship and all, and all that. And uh, many people think that you can get good influence out of that. But some people don't realize that also there's some very bad things that you could also learn from it and it might turn into a bad influence and may cause you to drift more and more away from God because there's some people out there that are still doing this and um, I just wanted to get that point out there and answer this question. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for sharing. Why don't we go to our next guest? And what's your name? Hey, my name is Carter. All right. What's your uh, comment or question? Yeah. So one lie I know that I hear a lot is in regards to what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. Um, As a young man who, you know, is constantly, um, not by my choice mainly, is uh, I see a lot of the news and social media. Um, There is two kind of sides to what it means to be a man that that are mainly talked about. Obviously, we have our, um, you know, to reference Aristotle, the golden mean, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, God's view of masculinity and what it means to be a man we have that but I feel a lot of us nowadays are either there is so much taken away from that and the subduing of masculinity um that has been here recently um for example you know like the uh the man being the head of the household uh that can be seen as you know like toxic you know there should be you know it should be equal in a marriage or whatever so you have stuff like that. And then in response to that, there's been this kind of hyper masculinity yep. where it's like, you know, oh, no, 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 actually, that's the right place for a man to be. And actually, he should do everything for his wife. And, you know, there's so you have this whole like other counter response that is also worldly. Um, and so it's just kind of this conflicting opinions. And it seems like the truth can get lost. Yeah. where there's a healthy masculinity. Yeah. And those are your what you're describing is different extremes that people can go to maybe out of a a yearning for trying to seek some kind of security in one of those things that becomes maybe their identity. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disfigured version of the reality, right? Those are great comments. Thank you for coming up. You know, what I wanted to, to move on to here is the concept of with all of this chaos, with the lies that we've been talking about, some of the examples that we've shared, it leads to us sometimes, Bryce, we just make mistakes sometimes, right? I mean, no, none of us are perfect, We've made mistakes in our past. I know I have. And it's only after our mistakes, after our sins, after assimilating confusion and chaos, sometimes even innocently, we don't always intend to assimilate chaos, that the depth of the anguish in our souls drive us to look above the place that we are living. And when we do that, we begin to hear the voice of God. And he brings us to the path of salvation, of which our baptism and chrismation are only the beginning. It truly lasts a lifetime. So how do we respond when the difficulties come, when we're surrounded with the lies all around us in our culture? It's only through the struggle and in facing difficulties when the conforming to Christ happens. It happens in the struggle. For many people, their own struggle, the despair, the loneliness, the pain is what brought them to the church. God in his benevolence allows us to experience that so that it brings us to him. When we experience the healing, we start to grow into our own manhood, and we begin to understand our place in his grand design. We grow into it. It's not just an academic or an intellectual exercise. It's the transformation of the soul, of the heart. It is being healed, and that is what redemption is. Yeah. Um, You know, what really comes to mind for me is when I was in the process of converting, to orthodoxy, Um, the first thing that I noticed was how unique the worship is as it pertains to just about anything else. I'd been to Roman Catholic Mass, I grew up in a Lutheran church, I'd been to evangelical churches as well. Nothing at all (laughs) is quite like orthodoxy. And through that, I think, in the worship, 
there is a discipline that goes into it. And there's a lot that you can learn about yourself really through just being in the liturgy. I think the participation in that is extremely important. But in my former confession, it seemed that a lot of the aspects of worship or just the aspects of being a part of that faith varied between an extreme emotional response that you would exhibit in church or in your conversations with people. You know, I just feel the spirit, you mm. know, got my hands raised in worship, right. things like that. And then a pure intellectual observation, which initially that's what I was searching for. You know, I'd read the book of Concord. I read the small catechism. I was confirmed. All that was up here in my mind. But, you know, everything in orthodoxy is so much more than that. It is all of our person being a part of it. And we are brought to Christ through all that. We are all brought before Christ through it. And we come as we are. I believe we do our best to recognize where our shortcomings are. And then we work with our Lord as we work out our salvation. So nothing is a one-time thing with any of this. I think as we all know, maybe if you're listening to this on the recording or you're present with us now, you know nothing is a one-time thing, right? Um, And we'll never have all the answers we desire when we desire them right away, right? This is, I think, hand-in-hand with one of the earlier comments of, you know, our pleasure would be to have everything we want right when we want it regardless of the consequences, regardless of if we're ready for that or not, regardless if it's good for us or not. But we press on, and we carry our cross through all of that. Yeah, Bryce, those are some great comments. And and for many, you know, it was a long and difficult road to find the Orthodox Church. Some of us were born into it. I'm a cradle Orthodox Christian. I was born into it. But many had to find it. They really had to find the Church. And it often involves a lot of suffering to find the Orthodox Church, Not the kind of suffering that led to death, but the kind of suffering that opens up the recognition of the necessity for God. For a lot of those people, they have the mindset that if they were just going to make the commitment, it had to be complete. It had to be full. There's no room for lukewarmness, for softness. You know, this is serious business, especially these days with what's going on in the culture. Sometimes people who suffer a lot and know that pain, they're the ones that embrace it the most. Put more simply, once you have tasted hell, you don't want to go back. And sometimes what drives us forward is we just get sick of death. We just get sick and tired of the death that's out there, of participating in that process of death. And we see where the path is going to go. And it's terrifying when we realize that. It will force us to look upward. Sometimes you look back and it can be a very painful process. And sometimes, some of us, you know, it takes that experience to open up the possibility of the magnificence and the power and the scope of God. Here's our second reflection point in discussion. If you guys want to come up and make a comment, please feel free. And here's the question I'm going to pose to everybody, and we'll have Bryce kick it off again. What was it that brought you to the Orthodox Church or to take your faith more seriously? That is a loaded question. You can give us the Cliff Notes version, Bryce. I, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't have enough time in this session nor in any episode to really go over that, <laughs> at least personally. But I think when I was first coming to the faith, um, the structure of everything was the most appealing to me. Mm. You know, the idea of a hierarchy, the idea of we can trace all this back to the beginning. Mm. In my former confession, we really didn't have that, at least not to the same degree. And so the ability after I became Orthodox to participate in the sacraments, such as Holy Confession, Holy Communion, Holy Unction, was, for lack of a better term, it was a game changer, really. Yeah. Because participating in the sacramental life, there's nothing in the secular life that can compare to it, essentially. And Orthodoxy will provide us with such a wealth of tools for lack of a better term, to discipline ourselves in spirit, mind, and body. So doing the morning prayers, that was something I'd never done before. You know, we had a quiet time was a thing in my former confession, and I think it was useful for what it was, but it didn't have the same kick, I suppose, Yeah. (laughs) as uh, the morning and evening prayers do, you know, when you're able, um, under the guidance of your spiritual father, you know, whatever that looks like for you participating in the sacraments, attending holy services, and as well as participating in the fast of the church. 
like I had Lent in my former confession, but not Orthodox Lent, right? Not anything close to that. And to me, seeing, you know, the discipline in that, seeing the spiritual growth, seeing how our body may become weaker, but our spirit grows stronger, that to me, that's unparalleled. And so gradually over the last five years of being Orthodox, I've begun to have a greater understanding. And the nice thing about this, the nice thing about it, I think the beautiful thing about it really is our faith is so extensive. Mm -hmm. The borders we're not even close to seeing, right? Even if if they're even our borders. Um, And I think through understanding the faith as well, and I think through really just going through all of it, understanding who I am too. You know, I think that's one of the main things that all of us have had in our life. That's a thought that we've had is, who am I? And trying to find yourself. And again, the culture gives you a lot of different ideas of who you are, what you want to be, who you should be. But our faith is lived, right? And we can't just think about it. We can't just contemplate it. We have to get the ball rolling. And so we gain understanding from the doing and not just the thinking, not just the reading and not just the idea of anything. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And, and Bryce, you know, this question is really for everybody. It's what brought you to the Orthodox Church or what brought you to take your faith more seriously. And, you know, in recent years, as you know, Bryce, I've, I've been striving to take my faith more seriously, but it's not yeah. been just because of myself. It's because of my family, my wife. You know, it's important to be connected to others. Does anybody else, is there one or two people that can come up and share their story? What was it that brought you to the Orthodox Church? It doesn't have to be a long story, just one or two points that you might want to share or to take your faith more seriously. Please share your first name again. Yes, this is Ben. So I uh, bumped into some Mormon missionaries, as we often do, and uh, I was told by them about their, uh, you may have heard this term, the apostolic keys of secession and uh, how they believe that those were lost when the apostles, uh, you know, fell asleep in the Lord. Uh, This got me uh, on the path of uh, finding out where those keys that were handed to. And uh, (laughs) I found that the New Testament church is uh, still alive and well, and uh, it doesn't need to be reconstructed as the Church of Christ attempted to. Uh, It didn't need to be uh, uh, schismed away from as the, as the, uh, the Romans had. Uh, or the Latins, as they're sometimes called. And uh, that was an easy path from uh, questioning their faith to finding ours. That's, that's great. That's beautiful. When you first started talking, I thought the Mormons were recruiting for us there for a minute. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, uh, when, they, when they called me again later, I, I had the pleasure of asking them, could I tell you about the Orthodox Church? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you for sharing, Ben. Can you state your name again for us? Hey, hello, it's Andrew again. Hey, Andrew, what do you have to say? Um, Right now, what brought me to the Orthodox Church is just like you, Michael. I am a cradle Orthodox, but how did I take my faith seriously? It's I really want to illustrate two points. One is knowledge, and I think that I reflected over my time, and uh, I started knowing more and more about God and His doings, and also some of the church history as well, and that kind of got me into taking my faith more seriously but more important from that in my opinion is probably my future and I just sat somewhere by myself and I just thought what am I doing with my life because I was at a rough spot in my life right now I was having trouble with my family I was having trouble in school and I just thought be more and more like God and what better way to do it than take my faith more seriously or joining your amen program like you said Well, thank you, Andrew. That's great. And you mentioned something that Bishop Nicholas has said over and over to us. It's all about becoming more like God. Mm -hmm. And that's a fancy word called theosis, but it really just means becoming more like God. Thank you, Andrew, for sharing. Please share your first name with us. Okay, my name is Gail. And I've been Orthodox for 35 years. And what I really want to talk about is is an occurrence I had uh, with a communion of the saints. So, um, 12 years ago, I did something pretty foolish, and uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I ended up uh, in the water in the North Pacific Ocean 
off of uh, Spruce Island, Alaska. And uh, I was in the water for quite a while. And it was uh, real, real early spring, and I got extremely hypothermic. But from where I was, I could see the cross on top of Mount Hermon. Oh, wow. And I had a conversation with St. Hermon. And uh, eventually it came to me that I had a waterproof cell phone. And I was in an area that had no cell communication. Yeah. But I got out the, in desperation, I got out my waterproof cell phone and was able to get uh, in contact with the dispatcher for the Alaska State Troopers. And I stayed in the water until the troopers retrieved me after 50 minutes. And, um, but during this time, I kept my eye on the cross on top of Mount Hermon. Mm. And uh, what that did is that after that, I kind of re, uh, reconfigured my life and uh, attempted to uh, support the work of St. Herman in Alaska and, uh, and, and come face to face with a saint. And so that's, that's my story of how I didn't become Orthodox, but uh, my Orthodox life bloomed immensely after that. Wow, that's a really beautiful story. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Thank God. Yeah, thank God for that. You know, some of us, we have, we have really monumental experiences that lead us to either take our faith more seriously, you know, to come to find the Orthodox Church. We've, there's so many people that have been coming to the Orthodox Church in the last couple of years. And Bryce, you and I have talked about that a lot in past episodes. And a lot of the people who are coming to the church now, a lot of especially the young men that we've interacted with, they have a real hard time with love and with giving love. You know, we have an acronym, our core values in the Antiochian men. It's an acronym, and it's the love acronym. L is leadership. O is obedience. V is vigilance. And E is endurance. But really, that, that kind of overarching virtue is love. It's yeah. the first letter of each of those, those virtues that make up our core values. And I want to talk a little bit about love, and especially those that are having a hard time with love, giving love. You know, sometimes people are afraid to love because some have never really received love or because love was always mixed with pain. You know, a lot of men, young men these days are coming from backgrounds like this and it, it really shakes them. It also shapes us and it's hard for many of us to trust God. It's hard for some of us to even think of God on our way to him because it just doesn't come naturally. And this is because some have never really known love, like I was saying. And so the only way that God can reach us sometimes is through suffering. Many often ask, why did I have to go through that? Why did I have to go through that suffering? And the answer is often that it was just the only way that the truth could enter. Because if a man does not know love, then how is he going to trust? How is he going to see God? It's very hard for that to happen. It causes men to go into what I call and what Father Hans has called an internal state of lockdown. It's very hard for guys who are locked down for the light and love to penetrate because those who they gave that love to growing up, maybe often they hurt them, neglected them, or they didn't return the love in a recognizable way. Yeah, it's, I guess it's kind of a cliche or a stereotype among men that a lot of us are very bottled up. Um... <laughs> And we've always been that way, right? Somebody asks you what's wrong, nothing. Don't want to talk about it. Don't whatever. want to show weakness. Right, right. Or, you know, there's the uh, age-old just communicate through grunts, <laughs> as we're all probably uh, been exposed to. But it's not a bad thing, and I think it's something that should be encouraged to really have conversations that push our boundaries a little bit in the sense of if you're struggling through something, there are certain ways to exert that struggle through maybe it's physical fitness or writing, whatever it may be. Um, but having a good relationship with other men, and I think particularly your father, can be an important aspect of it. And men learn how to be men from other men in the same way that women learn how to be women from other women. And so traditionally, the first man that a child will interact with is his father. And this relationship will continue throughout his life, God willing. And I think at times, especially now, and in the West, especially in North America, our fathers tend to be inclined to being this quiet and closed-off guy. You know, in my experience, 
that's kind of how it's been. And, you know, working through that over the years, I'm, I'm beginning to understand why. Mm. And I think as far as it goes with counteracting anything, I think understanding the why is very important to going forward, to pushing through it, to really growing through it, I think. And, you know, deeper conversations and understandings can never be understood at times because of how these interactions may be. Our conversations or experiences may fall flat, right? You know, asking for advice on something, whether it's, you know, careers or girls or whatever it might be. A lot of the time, you know, young men don't get the answers that they're looking for. And even then, other emotional things, you know, you can get very, very closed off with it. And I think a lot of the time we are left wanting for more, right? And I think this is a reality for some. And I do think that understanding this is the first step into alleviating the long-standing problems of relationship. And on top of that, you know, I think when we come into the church, the concept of a spiritual father mm. is something I had never understood before. I'd never seen it before. And over the years, I've been able to cultivate a relationship with a spiritual father. And that, not in a surrogate sort of way, but it's been, it's been an experience that I never had before mm. in a very beneficial way. Yeah, Bryce, and you know, a lot of the young men that we've talked to that have been coming to the church in our local parish uh, in Springdale, where you're from, and where I currently attend church, some of these guys that we've talked to, you know, they've grown up with maybe an absent father, and they've grown up a little bit alone and afraid to love. You know, we all crave love, but so many men are, again, they're locked down. It's this internal sense of lockdown, and because they're locked down, they can't feel it and they can't give it, you know, this love that they need and that they really, they just haven't experienced. Yeah. It's happening more and more. It's becoming more frequent. The, the more our chaos is, is, is just growing in the culture around us. And it's not because these men are evil or because their soul is disfigured or anything like that. It's the result of their experience, right? And what I'm describing, it's really the spiritual epidemic of our age. A lot of us come from that. You know, a lot of us come into the church with that in our background, and that's why the suffering is necessary, because it's only in the suffering that we can really break down that lockdown. But once the lockdown is broken, light can finally come in. And our Lord God, our Father in heaven, you know, he's not coercive. He doesn't force himself on anyone. The saints don't force themselves on anyone. We must come to them. But how do we come to our Father in heaven if we don't even really know the love of our Father here on earth, a lot of men are in that situation now. If some of us here in this room aren't in that situation or didn't have that experience, I bet you know somebody that did have that experience. Or you will get to know somebody that does have that experience because it is spreading like a plague. This experience is becoming more and more common. The lockdown is like a concrete encasement surrounding the hearts that are within us. And it's hiding and covering the pain that is deep and buried within us as well. And because the pain is associated with an experience that should have been loving, a lot of men grow up afraid to love because they're afraid of re-experiencing that pain. Here's our third reflection point and point for discussion. If anyone would like to come up and contribute, please make your way to the third microphone here. And here's the question I want to pose to all of you, and this should really hit home for everybody. How do you think that the COVID lockdowns may have compounded the problem of those who are already had existing internal lockdowns? Bryce, why don't you kick us off? And if anyone would like to come up and share, please do. I think for many, especially as the lockdowns went on, um, we were very fortunate in Arkansas to not have a stay-at-home order. Um, but still life changed quite a bit. And life has been a lot different for many of us for the last two and a half years almost. Um, but I do think it did compound on existing issues of anxiety and isolation by further putting people into positions of hopelessness, yeah. at least perceived hopelessness. For myself, I was already going through some stuff. You know, I graduated college, had no direction. And then you stack having to stay home on top of that. You know, initially it was okay. Had a little bit of time to really be confronted with myself, but then eventually that got to me, right? And I think for a lot of people it did. And I think in the sense that it was getting to them, the isolation, the loneliness, the depression, all of that, I, I don't think it was in the case of that the world was about to end, right? But I do think it was that life 
could never be lived as it should be, you know, with community, with being with other people, you know. And for many, I think myself included, life was a complete 180, you know, like no church, no school, unemployment for a lot of people, and this constant aura of fear. You're watching TV, you know, you're on your phone. All you're seeing is whatever's going on in the world, right? And <laughs> that can take a toll on your mind, it take a toll on your soul as well. Um, but I think in all that, there was a silver lining, for lack of a better term. We could still pray, you know. We could still watch the liturgy. We weren't completely cut off from all of it. Even though it may have seemed that way, we still had opportunities to grow. We still had opportunities to confront our suffering and go through it, you know, accept where we were, but not stay there. You know, I could still go outside. I could still see the sunshine. I think a lot of us had the same kind of idea, just trying to see where the good was in all of the, in all the bad. Yeah. We've had a couple of guests here that have some comments. I'm going to read the question here. If you want to slide over here, I'll just read it out loud one more time. How do you think the COVID lockdowns may have compounded the problem of those who already had existing internal lockdowns? Hey again, my name is Carter. Um, glory to God, I've been blessed with a mother and father that are very loving, and I've grown up in a household that has never hid that and has, um, has luckily um, just shown that to everyone. Um, and so I don't have any personal experience with kind of lockdown, um, but I do. I have several friends that um, that isn't the case for them. They either don't have a father figure or um, have one that they're not very close to. And so uh, I, I saw it, um, I saw the issues very uh, much compounded in COVID when um, they, did, they don't have this true love. They have this, uh, they have this false love that can kind of creep in. It's very easy to creep in. Um, so love to them is, you know, taking a hit of that drug or looking at pictures of women online, you know, that that's love to them. Yeah. And so you have this kind of false love creep in and it's, um, to them that's real. And, you know, that provides them momentary satisfaction. And I think during COVID when they were isolated, either with, you know, a father figure that they didn't have any connection to, maybe feared or, you know, wasn't present at all, it was easy for them to isolate. And that, false love becomes even more of a reality for them because there's no one there to tell them that that's wrong and that's harmful to them. Yeah, those are some great thoughts. Yeah. Why don't we have our next guest come up and if you can, again, state your first name before you respond. Hey, I'm Bailey. Um, so I think definitely there were a lot of negative side effects to being locked down. Um, I mean, like, if you look at the rates of mental health issues, like, it's skyrocketed. But at the same time, I think it's important to keep in mind that it wasn't entirely bad. Hmm. We were forced to kind of put our lives on pause and to think. And mm -hmm. sort of that forced introspection can be a good thing or a bad thing. But I know from personal experience, um, a lot of people that I've talked to who are catechumens or who are interested in orthodoxy, a lot of them started looking into orthodoxy during the pandemic because yeah. of all of the yeah. things that are happening in the world. And it kind of forces them to start taking things seriously. You know, for many people, it was the first time they seriously confronted death. And I guess long story short is, you know, though the lockdowns were by and large a bad thing, it did... Um, have an inadvertent effect on people's spirituality and caused a lot of people to take things a little bit more seriously than they would have otherwise. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I saw the same thing. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We have one more guest on this reflection point. Please uh, give us your first name and your response. Yeah. Hi, I'm Benny. And um, I think that the lockdowns from COVID were so unique to all of us because maybe the worst part of it, it brought it the worst in us was, was that we kind of all became, if you listen to all of the, the science or however you want to say it, that, you know, we needed to isolate from each other. We all potentially were each other's enemies, you know, yeah, as far as that, right. the, as far as the virus was concerned. And so, you know, what you guys were stating about being face to face here and how wonderful that is, um, you know, none of that was really possible at the time. So um, it wasn't just like a maybe like a terrorist attack when the whole nation had an, it felt like they had an enemy, but literally everyone person to person, 
your family, your best friend, <laughs> or even a stranger on the street, you, you could have psychologically made that person your enemy. And so I, I think that was a really difficult thing um, as far as locking down. And it, it could lead to the, the self-lockdown that you're talking about that, um, that young men or anyone uh, can endure, putting that concrete around their heart. Um, I have a question for you. Can I ask you? Please do. Okay. Um, so I have um, four adult uh, sons, and uh, all have left the church, uh, hopefully temporarily, but um, they're cradle Orthodox, and so a lot of times, a lot of the young men I, th their age I see coming into our church are, are not cradle Orthodox, or coming in from a different experience, um, like Bryce, for instance, and um, you know, from a different background or whatever. But for them, um, I guess my question for you, Michael, is they grew up in the church and so they have all the negativity of things that happened between their parents' own sin and yelling at them to get them to go to church on Sunday morning and making them go to church and all this built up, you know, possibly anger that could really harden their hearts toward God and toward the church. Um, I guess from you being cradle orthodox and coming back, if they were listening to this, what would you say to them? I guess maybe. <laughs> wow, that... that's that's uh, no pressure, right? No, no pressure. <laughs> that's a really good question. It is a good question, and I'll respond like this: um, We all have our brokenness, cradle orthodox or convert. Um, in my younger years, and this is no secret, I did not take my faith as seriously, and I went through the motions. I also was very jaded by some of the things that I experienced. Uh, many people know that my father's a priest, which means that I just knew about things, I heard things, and I was aware of things from the inside that can really get you jaded. You know, church politics is not fun. I experienced a lot of inauthenticity in church leadership when I was younger. Um, and unfortunately, that jaded me to the point where the church didn't seem like it fit into what uh, my life should be. But I'll tell you that, I'll tell you this, what I would say to, to your children or to really anybody, especially the cradle Orthodox who, you know, I have a lot of friends that have left the church that I grew up with that don't think that the church has a place in their life. They've given up on institutional religion, on organized religion. I hear this all the time. I would, I would tell them this. I would say, what do you think is better? Do you think it's better to be outside of the body of Christ and to criticize it from the outside? Or would you rather be a part of the body of Christ trying to purify it from the inside? Um, it's very easy to look at all the imperfections. It's very easy to point the finger and to realize that the church is led by human beings and it's not perfect. But if we all run from the church, if we all think that we're going to find life outside of the church, we're going to be drinking sand. We're not going to be drinking water. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, too, people have to go through, like what we've been talking about, struggles and unfortunately suffering. And the hardest thing as a parent is knowing that your kids have to suffer. We want to shield them from everything. I want to shield my kids from all kinds of suffering. But in the end, they have to want it for themselves. I needed to want it for myself. And this was a very painful process. I had to go through a real crisis to want it for myself. And sometimes we have to let our children go out and make those mistakes and hope that the mistakes aren't huge, pray that they're not huge, but that God will allow those circumstances to lead them back. And so what I would say is, especially to someone who's outside the church, if they were listening, that had left it, you're not going to find life outside of the church. And I know because I lived to the beat of my own drum for a very long time, and it led me to nothing but death and chaos and destruction and I ended up hurting a lot of people along the way you know our all sins are equal in God's eyes but our sins affect people to different degrees the seriousness of our sins are ripples that affect other people and sometimes and unfortunately today adolescence is being extended so much we're so selfish and me focused we don't realize how our sins are affecting other people and then all of a sudden when something big happens that's the wake-up call we need so I guess the last thing I would say is don't wait for that crisis to happen. It doesn't have to end in terrible suffering and people being hurt to extreme depth. You know, at any moment we can choose, but we have to choose. We actually have to make the choice. And so that's why I tell people that I'm a cradle Orthodox convert. I'm converting every day. 
And if I don't have the mentality of someone who's converting to Christ on a daily basis, I might as well be outside the church. So that would that'd be what I say. Thank you. Absolutely. That was a great question. I appreciate that. Um, and we can talk more after this recording if you'd like to. I want to move on to how this is going to change, especially for the people who are under lockdown, more internal lockdown, because the lockdowns are pretty much over when it comes to COVID, right? So how is it going to change for these men who are under lockdown? This changes when the isolation becomes so painful that our internal lockdown starts to collapse. And this goes right back to the response I was just giving to that question. You know, sometimes the isolation that causes the suffering and the loneliness itself becomes the means by which we cry out to God out of desperation. This happened to me. We just can't take the pain anymore. And that cry is what begins the healing. Mm. This is one of the main drivers for why so many young Orthodox men, or just men in general, have been coming to the church or coming back to the church over the last couple of years. Yeah. The feeling of despair and the inability to connect is what the philosophers call existential estrangement. You know, many are walking around with an invisible concrete case around us like I was describing. Nobody can see it. You can even reach through and maybe shake somebody's hand that has this concrete case around their heart because it's really surrounding their heart, but it's invisible. So we're here in the church to be healed, and the only way that we're going to be healed is through love. You know, what what comes to mind for me is that People will often look for external outlets or substances, really, when you think about it, to alleviate their pain within, right? To try and break through that concrete casing, but you're just pouring more concrete on top of yourself. Right. So, you know, in reality, these things that we attempt to use to serve us, in turn, make us serve them, and they break us down further and increase our woe, right? So many will get to a point where they just they can't take it anymore. They may be able to recognize this struggle for what it is. And it, can be, it, it, it is more than can be healed with promises of external factors. Any type of supernatural substance we might want to take, whatever we're watching on the Internet, whatever addiction it might be, whatever we occupy our minds with, that isn't the answer. You know, and I've, I've met people who were chest deep in toxic relationships, addictions, anxiety, who've been able to recognize these things Mm. and they've been corrupted by them, but they can switch it by finding solace in the church. And that isn't that, you know, I showed up to church and everything was perfect. Right. Everything was lily white. Everything in my life completely fell away. And all I saw was flowers and butterflies. Right. But that's not always the case. But when we come into the church, you know, and, and when we're there, we have opportunities to find fullness. And that's what it's all about. I mean, Bishop Nicholas has talked about it. You know, the main purpose of the Antiochian men, and I think the main purpose in the Christian life is to become more like God, right? And you can't do that outside of this context. You can't do it outside the context of the church. And so that doesn't mean that faith is seen as a self-help seminar or, you know, some type of uh, get spiritually rich quick scheme. (laughs) But it's a place where we're better able to face our struggles and it's not even just a place it's so much more than that yeah definitely and and Bryce you know we've been talking a lot about this concrete case that surrounds a lot of men's heart young men especially today and how does brotherhood tie into this the title of this session is the beauty of brotherhood right and we've been hinting at the key to all of this But we have to understand that there's really a pattern behind this. A lot of the young men that are coming to us right now that Bryce and I have spent many, many hours talking to, uh, here's here's what's going on. There is really a pattern, and this is what happens. If we go through life with a concrete case around our soul, eventually we can't handle the loneliness and the anguish, so it starts crumbling. And this is really what's been happening in our conversations with a lot of these young men. They tell us about this. We can sometimes feel like our whole life is crumbling, and sometimes it does. In my case, it did. But that's what enables us to rise from the dust and the ashes. But what do we do about the pain? What do we do about the fear to connect with another human being, especially man to man? The only way healing comes is through that connection. And for men, it is not connection with a woman. Now, there's obviously a place for that, okay? But it is connection with a man. We're talking about the beauty of brotherhood. 
the beauty that we have, Bryce, in our home parish in Springdale, in Arkansas, at St. Nicholas. Because the way a man discovers his own masculinity and grows into it is only in communion with another man. And you spoke to this earlier when you said men need to learn from men how to be a man. They can't learn that from women. Men are the ones that have to teach that. So here's our fourth reflection point and open for discussion for anyone who'd like to share. What are some of the practical ways we can connect with these young men who are coming to our churches? And I really want you guys to think about this. There is a wave of young men coming to Orthodox Christianity right now. What are the, some practical ways that when they walk into the church doors, we can connect? Bryce, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, so I'll actually start with a, a personal story. Um, not too personal, but uh, <laughs> my experience in my conversion process um, was the welcome extended to me by the man who had become my sponsor when I was chrismated. Um, I saw in him someone that was very similar to me, um, not just in, you know, wanting to be a part of the church, but in that his experiences that defined him, you know, I really think that that spoke to me. And I think the biggest thing that we can do is being genuine. Mm people coming up to you, having conversations with you, that is what matters in the sense that, you know, if you can establish a genuine connection with someone and there's the trust there, and it's all within this context of being a part of the church, that's a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, Michael, over the years, we've had countless inquirers come into our parish, and I'm sure if you're listening to this or you're here with us now, you can attest to this as well. All the inquirers coming to the church the spiritual advisor of the Antiochian men, Father Hans, has said that it starts out as a trickle, and it's turning into a stream. Eventually it'll be a river, right? And probably a flood. Right, and in being equipped to handle this, you know, I came in kind of when it was a trickle, but being equipped to handle this, being able to just be yourself and be honest, right? And to really love these people as our brothers, and just, I think, speaking from the heart, right? Yeah. And knowing that, I guess knowing that it's, it's more than yourself, right? It can be very easy to be closed off. That's me a lot of the time. I'm a little introverted, but getting to meet people, getting to talk to people, really just not necessarily seeing ourselves in them, but able to connect to them on a way that is more than just, hello, how are you? Yeah. Right? Well, we have some guests that have joined us up here. If you could just uh, share your first name again as you uh, uh, share your comment. Yeah, my name's Ben. I think uh, one of the best ways to, uh, can you ask the question again? Yeah, so what are some of the practical ways we can connect with the young men who are coming to our churches? Yes, a good way to connect with them and to engage them in the church is to get them involved in serving our church. Uh, Service is one of the ways, perhaps the only way, in which a boy becomes a man. We have to learn to put others first. And when uh, and I'll say this as well. It's, a, it's the way in which a girl becomes a woman, too. This is, this is what, what it is to be mature. That is that we, we put others before ourselves. Uh, and then there's the old idiom, the grass is always greener on the other side. If someone's in the church, they may think the grass is greener elsewhere. There's a better idiom. The grass is greener where you water it. Mm. And so we get them to water this grass to serve this church. They will become engaged and then less likely to leave it. I love that. I love that, Ben. Thank you so much for sharing that. Please share your name and your comment. Hey, this is Kellen. I just wanted to say probably the most effective way to engage young men in orthodoxy right out of the gate is to underscore the fact that this is a challenge that forces you to grow. Mm. This is not a place to seek comfort. Comfort is a killer. I believe it was C.S. Lewis that said something along the lines of, I knew religion would never make me happy. I knew that a bottle would do that. (laughs) If you want comfort, I don't recommend Christianity. And he was onto something when he said that. Orthodoxy is the special forces of spiritual warfare. So when you walk into a church and you see the iconostasis and the altar, you know that this is the center of training for the war that you're going to fight for the rest of your life. And it's going to pull you out of whatever has been forcing you into lockdown. 
you're going to learn to serve others. You're going to learn how to serve yourself through growth. That is, the point of theosis is to grow closer to God in an experience that's both individual and stretches out to everyone around you. So this challenge that's going to force you to grow is going to be the best experience that you've ever had, not because it felt good, but because it was good and it is good. Yeah, and then men love a challenge, right, Bryce? Uh, it's essential, Yeah, I think. Those are great comments. Thank you, Kellen. Why don't you share your name and your comment? Next up, we have another guest here. Hey, it's Carter. Um, one thing that I noticed as a uh, fairly recent convert to orthodoxy, uh, one thing that worked for me that really got me uh, involved was this, um, sh- this kind of stressing of brotherhood what it means to be in a brotherhood and what that can do for you. And then also the fact that orthodoxy will kind of change change your view and change what it means to be a man. You have all these ideas of what it means to be a man, but orthodoxy, it, it changes your perspective a lot. It teaches you a lot of new things and changes a lot of old behaviors. Um, and so I know a big thing uh, coming into orthodoxy that I've seen a lot of others um, express is that, you know, uh, I'll find a good uh, traditional wife, you know, but it's like, well, are you the kind of man that that woman would want? Exactly. And so I think a lot of us need to learn how to first be that man. Yep. And that's what's essential in orthodoxy to where you can get to a point where you can foster, you know, a relationship and have a family. That's great. Thank you for that comment. That was were beautiful words. And we have another guest. Would you share your name and comment with us? Yes, I'm Father Matthew. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I think that one of the wonders of boys is that when you watch them grow up, they're constantly striving to become heroes. You know, I have three boys and I see them playing as Uh, ship's captains and superheroes and every conceivable kind of hero that you can think of. And um, as we grow up and we become men, we find that the opportunities are much more challenging to be heroes in the world around us and that we are being distracted to other roles rather than being heroes. And what does it mean to be our hero? It means to protect, it means to uh, lead, it means to be vigilant, to take care of, it means to cherish And we're called to cherish from God and from the church. We're called to cherish our wives. We're called to cherish our children. We're called to cherish those that we work with, to cherish the church. I think that the number one thing in some sense, and everything that's already been said, I I mean, it's all all in some aspect the same thing, I, I suppose. But the church really gives us an opportunity to teach men how to cherish. And in doing so, that's where they learn to be a real leader or to be the head of their house or anything like that because the source of their, um, of their power, in the manner of speaking, like the, the, what they, their ability, the ability that they have, the energy that they, that they have, the, the source of their authority in any relationship that they have comes from their ability to cherish the other person, whether it's their wife or their children or whoever it may be. Because when you cherish somebody, you receive from them themselves. You receive from them their trust in you. You receive from them the honor of leading them or of uh, caring for them and protecting them. They give you these things because you have given them the one thing that every person wants, which is to be cherished. It goes back to Genesis itself. Satan's words to Adam and Eve were actually... Does God really love you? And every one of us has that same question and needs that question to be answered. And we need it to be answered, not only does God love us, but do all of the people whom God made for us to be in fellowship with, our brothers, for instance, do they really love me? Do I need to have my guard up against them? If we can learn to cherish one another, then we will give our young men the space for them to find themselves in God and in their relationships with each other. So I think that we have to, sometimes it's good, I think, uh, to put it in, the, in, in, a, in a particular context that helps us to know what the source of our energy is, what drives us and inspires us to these things. Otherwise, leadership can simply be management or it can be power. Right. But yeah. cherishing is very important, I think. Forgive me. Thank you, Father Matthew. Those were beautiful comments. And we have one more guest up here before we move on with a comment. Please share your name and comment with us. Okay, my name's Benny. Um, boy, those were all hard to follow, I gotta say. Um, but 
I think maybe what I didn't hear, which is just a really practical first time, I think what I heard were long-term, wonderful to, to get men involved. But the very first time they come and you see them, I think is to connect them with someone. That, you know, that not, not to necessarily disconnect yourself, but like, for instance, a few weeks ago, an 18-year-old guy came, you know. I'm old enough to be his dad, maybe almost his grandfather at this point. So, so I just made sure that some of the 18, 20-something-year-old guys, I said, go invite that guy to eat with us right now. You know, he was, I had talked to him already, and I saw him stand there. I said, one of you young guys, go get him. And, mm. he, and they did. And so connect them either, either with it, whether it's an age demographic, they go to the same university that someone's going to, Maybe it's a profession that, or a hobby, something that you that you hear that oh gosh yeah so and so you know in right. your mind loves to do whatever it is kayaking or something yeah and just make that connection and make sure that they they feel welcome and they get engaged with someone else yeah besides. plug them in those are great comments thank yeah. you and we have one more comment before we move on uh, go ahead and share your name and comment with us uh, my name's Charles oh providentially I didn't know that Benny was going to say that but he <laughs> sort of said something similar about to what I was going to That's suggest okay. and you know one thing I was, that comes to mind is um, no matter how locked down that you personally might feel there's someone who's probably in worse shape than you are so yeah, sure so um, I think um, obviously one thing that's been you know therapeutic for me as well as something I could suggest to someone coming in the church is um, uh, seek out an individual absolutely who needs to hear from you yeah. who needs who needs um, maybe a word or, or or something like that and then and then you know just go do it you know yeah. just go go and reach out and and find out what uh, needs um, need to be met. And um, perhaps that's something that we could suggest to who, whoever we come face to face with. And you know, um, you know, uh, so sometimes you know the go- you know the gospel you know isn't something you can prove you know theoretically or you know you know at least that makes sense to the heart. But um, but if you uh, go and and uh, basically uh, treat the um, you know the the, the uh, lowest of the lowest, the weakest of the weakest. Mm-hmm. Um, then that then that's how you'd find Christ. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> that's how you'd find Christ. Right. So, so if you um, can, uh, you know, suggest to someone, you know, to seek out that person, whoever, whoever that is. Take the initiative. And then yeah. uh, seek out, you know, seek out the lost. Have, you know, have compassion on that person, and right. on a one to one, you know, basis. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your comment. Let's move on now to a big topic here that's related to everything we've been talking about and specifically is going to harken back to a talk we just heard from Father John Oliver earlier today. We live in a culture that is just completely sexualized. It's a sexualized culture. And for men, this is particularly challenging, especially these days. And part of the reason for the sexual chaos in our culture is because it's driven by this desperate need to connect with each other. And we've been talking about this need for connection. A lot of guys, they think that they've got to connect with a woman in order to understand what it means to be a man. But women can't teach men that. They can't teach about being a man. Just like I can't teach my daughter about being a woman. The reason why it gets to be a sexual connotation or a context is because the craving to be loved by a father is so deep that it may confuse eros, God's vivifying, life-giving love, with eroticism. And this is a trap that a lot of men fall into. I know I fall into this trap myself. The real reason that our culture is so sex-crazed is because people are looking for life that can only come from God, but they're looking for it in the wrong places and in the wrong ways. You know, when I was in high school, there was an uh, acronym that became rather popular within society, I suppose. It was YOLO, you only live once. Yeah. And I think as it pertains to this conversation is there's two sides to the coin of only living once. You either live for today, you either live for whatever's going to make you happy right away, right now, or you can choose to live as um, I believe it's St. Isaac the Syrian says, um, you've been given this life for repentance. Do not waste it in vain pursuit. That's right. Right. And a lot of the time, you know, 
and we're speaking from a male perspective, you know, and <laughs> we have these desires, we have these drives, and we can either utilize this drive or this desire for vain pursuit, or we can do it for creation, you know, to be creative, to build, maybe with our hands, maybe with writing, whatever avenue it might be, pouring ourselves into that rather than jumping at the chance to make ourselves happy for an hour. Yeah. However long it is, right? And, you know, St. Maximus the Confessor said, and this is referencing Father Hans from a few episodes back, the desire behind all desire, including inordinate desire, is ultimately desire for God. Right. So through all of that, you know, through all the bad, at the end of the day, we really are desiring God, but we're looking in all the wrong places for him. And we may not even consciously be thinking that. But that is, at the end of the day, what we need to search for. And I think all people, that's what we're looking for, but we're just looking in the wrong places, right? Yeah, and when that happens, when we're looking for God in the wrong place, you know, a lot of times for men, eros gets collapsed in and confused with eroticism because eros and the love between a man and a woman is actually for the creation of new life. Right. That's its primary purpose. It's something given to us by God, but it's something we woefully misunderstand a lot of times. And what gets pushed into that action and that category of sexual activity, it's our own desire to be loved by God the Father. And this is so key. So the healing that most of us need is to know the love of a father. That is what is often missing. That's what so many men these days have never had. And ultimately, so many men these days just don't know love. As I said earlier, they've been deprived of love. And the healing of the soul comes in the relationship, ideally with a spiritual father. And we've talked about this in past episodes. Bryce, you brought it up many times. The important role of having a spiritual father, which it's not always possible. But even if it's not possible, authentic love between brothers can supply much of what is needed as well. And this is going to come to our next reflection and discussion point here. How can we show brotherly love to those who have never had a healthy experience of love from a father figure? And I'll pose that question to all of you. And please come up if you have a comment to share. You know, there's a lot of men, you you yourself may not be one of them, but again, so many men are coming to the church that are coming from this background where they haven't had a healthy experience of love from a father figure. So how do we show those men brotherly love, Bryce? That's a good question. Um, There's two things that come to mind right now, and I look forward to in the discussion for more ideas and opportunities to, to think about this, but there's two things that we need to do in my mind to accomplish in order to show brotherly love among one another. The first, I think this should go without saying, but I I really think we need to understand it is to be authentic with one another. You know, obviously we should already be genuine with people we come across, but in this way, we're able to foster a welcoming environment. And the second thing I think is to meet these guys where they're at, right? Uh, In my former confession, that was a big thing, meeting people where they're at. But the second part of that is don't leave them there. You know, seeing where they're at and maybe you are in a similar position at one time or another. You know, maybe you're going through your struggles right now, but really bringing them along with you and and going forward, right? One thing that I was presented with in my conversion was finding a place where I felt like I had finally belonged. My whole life, I was looking for something. And I found that in the Orthodox Church, you know, and there were people there. There are people there that are now who continue to be a driving force for that, even though I moved away and I'm gone. That's still a really big part of my life. Yeah, let's hear from some of our guests. Please share your name and comment with us. Yeah, this is Ben. And uh, I struggled my whole life with talking more than than I listen. Uh, I should should look at at the person I'm speaking with as a reminder. They have two ears and one mouth, as do I. Uh, That should be a reminder that listening is key when it comes to showing that we care for someone. My wife will tell you I struggle with the same thing, even today. So for these, these young men who don't have a, a strong experience of love, it might be there was no one there for them to hear them, to truly listen to, to what it is they needed to tell uh, someone. Uh, when, we, when we listen, we should, we should think of another question to ask them to keep them talking. Uh, this is going to create a bond. Mm. Uh, we feel close to those people after we've, after we've spilled our guts to them. We feel like, you know, we have a friendship. Mm. It's, it's not the other way around. If I was to, to, to talk at you for, for an hour, I would feel close, close to you, but you wouldn't feel close to me. Right. You may feel 
repelled by this obnoxious person who just <laughs> talked to, at you for an hour while I walk away from that uh, feeling like Michael's such, such, a, such a great guy. Uh, let's, let's let them think of us as, as, as good people mm. by showing them that we care by listening. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point and a great comment. Thank you, Ben, for sharing that. Please share your name and comment with us. Hello, I'm Andrew. And uh, again, on uh, Ben's, question, Ben's answer, really, is just, I like to add on to that just to, um, just to add them in, not to shut them out on like activities we do together as a church and actually bring them in. Like if we're doing like a service project or something like that, let them join or fellowship we could just not leave one person just out on just by himself doing his own thing we could just have him involved in conversations with each other and probably uh hopefully he will learn this person will learn more and more about uh orthodoxy and probably have a better chance of fitting in with where we come from and who doesn't have a father figure in their life to teach them about this importance yeah that's great great comment you want to include everybody make sure you don't exclude anyone you know bishop nicholas always tells us we want to reach every single person in the diocese we can't leave anyone behind yeah that's a great point thank you for the comment please share your name and comment with us hey this is kellen one thing that i think is forcing men into lockdown that requires the opposite to bring them out of it is this awkward energy that's displayed in public interactions concerning any form of affection verbal or physical whatever there's this unspoken and sometimes very loudly spoken accusation to a man who just wants to show how much he cares for someone there's an accusation that that interaction is unhealthy and it gets all sorts of tearing labels put on it yeah and if you look at past generations you'll see that this was not a problem there are hilarious pictures of minors just all over each other yeah i've seen those pictures yeah. and these are these are examples of healthy affection being displayed by men is not a bad thing to display affection and it's especially not good to call it specifically feminine or to call a man feminine for showing how much he cares for someone so the antithesis to the unhealthy uh, lockdown of affection is to encourage healthy affection in scripture we have this command to greet our friends with a holy kiss mm. and even if that holy kiss looks different as our generations progress to remove it entirely is to remove interaction entirely. It's to cross out brotherhood yeah. from the statement that is growing closer to Christ. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Kellen. We appreciate it. And we're going to bring this now to a close and, and, and bring this to a conclusion. And specifically, we want to conclude by really reflecting on what is the beauty of brotherhood. You know, the Apostle Paul talks in Scripture all the time about the love of the brethren. You know, he says the love of the brethren in Scripture. And, and one of the reasons he talks about it is that that's how God delivers his healing. When we learn to love our brother and when we learn to receive the love of our brother, and sometimes that part is harder, learning to receive that love, we will see within that relationship God's transformative power in our own lives. It does not occur outside of that relationship because it does not exist as an abstraction. It exists as a concrete experience, which means we must learn how to love and we must learn how to receive love. The transformative power of God, the healing power of God, which really comes through the relationship that we cultivate with other men, it must be a relationship of love. The role of a spiritual father is critical, and every Orthodox Christian must have a spiritual father. Yeah, you know, we mentioned this before, and I think we've even mentioned it today, is that among the many aspects of orthodoxy that makes it unique is the application of a spiritual father. In my former confession, there was an idea of a mentor or someone to look up to when you needed advice or guidance, whatever it may have been. But spiritual fatherhood goes much, much deeper. 
And these men are leaders in our parishes, and they have experiences that help us in our struggles. So oftentimes we can get caught up in the flow of society around us. You know, we can get caught up in our own heads, as I myself am prone to doing. Um, But having a spiritual father gives us an ability to combat this, whatever the world, the flesh, our thoughts are trying to tell us, right? And, you know, I am someone who tends to overthink, someone who tends to be risk-averse, introverted, whatever it may be. And for many years, I had no outlet to talk about that. You know, I'd talk to my friends and it'd be like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. It's not an answer, right? (laughs) You want actual direction. And, you know, in, in my experience with my spiritual father over the years, you know, he has helped me in a great deal to gradually learn how to deal with these ailments and, and go forward. Yeah, Bryce, and when a father pours his love into the soul of his son, whether that's a biological father or a spiritual father, the son really comes alive. And the son returns the love to the father, and the father rejoices when he sees his son become a man. Mm-hmm. But we can do that with brothers, too. It's a man's relationship with his brother that should be one of mutual edification. You help your brother and you support him and you respect him, but it's important that it does not revert into some kind of adolescent competition, which can sometimes happen. Competition is good. Guys like to fight. They like to be challenged. You know, we're just kind of made that way. We're wired to kind of be like that. So we should challenge each other. I think the challenging is good. But maturity is is very, very important because guys sometimes get together and they'll descend into this adolescent competition with each other sometimes, trying to just one-up each other, right? You've Mm -hmm. been in those situations. I know I have. Of course. But we can't do that. We're called to be mature men. We need to strive for actually being mature for that maturation process. We have to be strong. The love between men is a love that vivifies, that gives life. Our soul desires life, and the life that God gives us is all-encompassing. We grow and become stronger men in relationship with other men. It doesn't happen by itself. But when the relationships have to be one of adolescent competition, growth can't happen. So it must be mutual edification and a mature context. And we can't be afraid to love. This is the way of Christ. It's the way by which a redemption occurs, and it's the way our souls will be full. It gives us what we desire, and it gives us what we crave. And what we all crave is love, and especially the love of God, the love of God through the love of a brother. Well, that's our show for today. We appreciate all of our guests here in person at St. Ignatius Orthodox Church. We thank you for joining us for this episode of Coming Out of Chaos. Please remember to check out our website at antiochianmen.org to learn more about our organization. We also have many videos available that can be found on that website as well as on our Amen YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and any of the major podcast platforms. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher, just to name a few. So be sure to follow us on the platform of your choice. We'd also appreciate a positive review if the platform allows for it. Please share this podcast with your friends and help us to spread the word about it. We want to thank everyone who's been sending us some great feedback on our podcast episodes. If anyone would like to send us some feedback, just send an email to amendomse at gmail.com. That's A-M-E-N-D-O-M-S-E at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions or comments for us. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.